So I get a, a request for that, but yeah, okay. Well, we'll get started. Um, next slide, please, Dan. Yep. So good morning, all. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ipsal Torres with Lucy Run, working out of the County of Ontario before diving into heat pump fundamentals, space conditioning, and water heating with Dan. I'll be rolling out through some housekeeping slides. Next slide, please. I'm sure by now all of you are very familiar with Zoom, but we ask that everyone make sure they are on mute throughout the duration of the training. If you were to like to verbally participate, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll get to you with, with all your questions. We encourage you to use the chat, the chat box. Um, we would like to get to know a little more about who's tuning in today. So Sarah, if you could please uh, launch our, our attendee introductory poll. Um, it's just an easy way to get a gauge of who is here in the room today, but also if you'd like to introduce yourself through the chat box, please feel free to do that. Um, we'd love to know where you're coming from today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there we go. Before we get rolling, just a few words about who we are. If you all are new to our trainings, we are the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, aka 3C Run, which is a collaborative partnership between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. We serve to improve energy efficiency in our region by offering free programs and services for building professionals and households. 3C Run is funded by ratepayer dollars that we all pay into our utility bills through the public goods charge. The benefit of being ratepayer funded is that there is no cost to those we serve. And as a regional energy network, we are able to return those dollars back to our local economy, which has historically missed out on, on some of these funds. Uh, next slide, please. So today there are a few staff members on our training today. Um, we have this beautiful Ventura County backdrop. So feel free to send us direct messages if you have any questions. Next slide, please. 3C Ren currently offers three programs. Next slide, please. Our first one being our Energy Code Connect program, which serves building professionals offering services from everyone from plan examiners and inspectors to architects and contractors for both residential and non-residential application. ECC offers three distinctive services, energy code coach and over the phone online, over the counter and in the field title 24 consultation service to help building professionals navigate California energy code trainings with courses that are designed to increase overall energy code comprehension, compliance and enforcement and quarterly regional forums covering policy and technical issues relevant to California energy code. Next slide, please. Our next program is our home energy savings program in which we offer a multifamily incentive program which pays property owners incentives for comprehensive energy upgrades and a single family program in which you can access incentive payments directly. It can be paid for meter energy savings of your customers. Next slide, please. Uh, and then our building performance training program that serves current and prospective building professionals with trainings offered to architects and engineers, contractors and real estate professionals. BPT offers expert instruction covering Technical skills related to building science principles and systems for high performance buildings, as well as soft skill training, such as sales, marketing, and communication techniques in order to grow your business and stay in your career. Through BPT and ECC, we provide professional <laughs> credits, and we also offer certifications such as NAR Green designation, Passive House Design Consultant, and we will offer BPI certifications in the coming year. Next slide, please. Today's training is brought to you by our High Performance Fundamentals Program, a new initiative through our Building Performance Training Program. Next slide, please. 
Here's a little bit more context about what high performance refers to in the series. It refers to buildings that are designed, built, and commissioned to achieve above code optimized performance. We decided to also hone in on how specialized companies offering high performance design and construction services in many parts of the state experience high demand ongoing backlogs and difficulty finding qualified hires. Next slide, please. Here are some of the goals we centered for the series around preparing aspiring building practitioners for competitive job opportunities and for those in the industry provide a fresher intake and or supplement prior building science knowledge. Next slide, please. The content presented to you through the series was developed in consultation with a dozen of national experts in the field. Based on the foundational knowledge they are looking for in new hires, rooted in fundamentals of building science and the design construction and businesses practices that distinguish high performance practitioners from conventionally trained competitors. Uh, next slide, please. Here are some of the posters that have been part of the series thus far. Coming up, we have the water heating distribution best practices coming in October and how to assess a home for electrification coming in November. Next slide, please. And 3C Run plans to further program, the further this program and in development, we have a formal certificate of completion, field-based hands-on classes to complement initial series of lecture classes and mentorship and peer learning activities to support participants learning process. Um, next slide, please. And without further ado, I'll hand it off to Dan to get us started with today's training. Thank you and welcome, Dan. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, so we're going to talk about heat pump um, fundamentals for both space heating and uh, <clears throat> water heating. And I have to apologize. I'm going to end up clearing my, uh, my throat a bunch this morning. Um, I live very close to one of the fires and <clears throat> one of two things is happening to me. The smoke has finally gotten to me or I'm legitimately getting a cold. I don't know which. Um, so I'll try not to uh, um, make you deal with that too much, but please forgive me being a little bit off in terms of how my voice sounds. Um, having said that, we have um, 90 minutes to go over like a ton of stuff. Um, heat pumps are <clears throat> this uh, technology that the way um, sort of the world is dealing with them, they seem like they might be magic, right? Like they're going to solve all of our problems. And that is an overstatement. And at the same time, they have this incredible potential to solve a lot of problems that we are facing. And we're going to try to make sense of that. And uh, there are slides in this slide deck that are sort of like the outline from a day long class that I teach in another venue. So um, this is truly sort of um, key details and an overview to help you guys kind of take a step forward and identify areas where there's more to learn. Um, my uh, background getting into this is as a contractor. Um, I'm a very hands-on person. I've uh, been working in the trades um, since my teens and I'm in my fifties now. So a little while, um, not always in performance, performance contracting has been maybe the last, I don't know, 15, 18 years, something like that. And, uh, what's really great about performance contracting is we learned that there were things about buildings that didn't work very well that everybody was doing and that the normal best practice was like eh, just kind of okay and that we could do better and that there was a way we could test our own work um, and and ensure at the point of construction that we had done a better job than sort of the industry standard um, and so the the other things that it's will mention um, like you know bpi training and and some of those things don't answer all of the questions about performance training, but they're great resources. They'll open a bunch of doors, or performance construction, I'm sorry. Um, they'll open a bunch of doors for you in terms of how to think about buildings, what tests are available to you, what you can do. 
So um, take advantage of those resources as they become available. Um, and so the other thing that I meant to say at this point is uh, we work on sort of uh, the whole range of buildings, right? So we're doing heat pumps and we're working on huge Tahoe homes that are just massive. Um, I mean, you could argue that maybe they should never have been built, right? Like if you're trying to save the world, they're just giant and they're largely unoccupied. Um, but those people are still concerned with their environmental footprint, right? So they, they're putting out tons of solar, they're going to electrical appliances and we're doing heat pumps for them, even though those buildings are in a challenging climate. Um, and then sort of the other end of the spectrum is, is down lower in elevation. And uh, well, you'll see a picture. Um, this, by the way, is how you can try to track me down after the presentation. You're welcome to send a question. You're welcome to try to call. Um, and I say try to call because I am a working contractor and I can't always answer the phone. But if you catch me driving or something, I'll generally you know, give you 15, 20 minutes and, and answer a question or just talk about how these things work. So that's how you can get a hold of me if you need me. Um, this is one of the Tahoe homes. This one actually is a passive house. Um, so it uh, has little tiny heating and cooling systems. Um, it's very, very airtight. It's very nice ventilation system, extremely well insulated. And it's in South Lake Tahoe. This is what it looked like while we were working on it, right? Just getting buried in snow. Um, and this is from last week. This is the um, sort of a stretched picture of the dashboard of my truck. And it's 109 degrees out. Right? And so across that spectrum of conditions, we're installing heat pumps and they're working well for people. Um, so I think probably all of you are represented in that sort of, uh, you know, a, a range of climates in terms of the places that you work. Um, <clears throat> so we have, that, uh, we have that in our favor. Like these machines have come a long way. If I were talking to a group of sort of like old HVAC contractors who've been doing this for a long time, they generally would say things like, well, you know, your customers are going to be uncomfortable and they're not, you know, they won't heat the building well enough and all of these things that we used to think, <coughs> excuse me, um, that turn out to not really be accurate, right? Um, the machines are much, much better than they used to be. And we know a lot more about how to install them so that they function well. Um, so these are pictures of heat pump jobs that we did. And there'll be a bunch more photos, right? This is a ducted system. That is the sort of typical wall head that everybody's most familiar with. And these are outdoor units, right? There's three different heat pumps mounted in this photograph. And then on the lower right hand of this slide is a heat pump water heater. Um, and so all of these technologies are things you're going to see, regardless of what you do in construction, you're going to see more and more of this. Um, so today we're gonna try to cover what is a heat pump? What are they used for? What benefits do they offer us? Um, we need to talk about refrigerants, right? This whole, the reason we're here today is we wanna decarbonize the built environment, right? Which means release less carbon into the atmosphere and improve the, the trend toward warming that's happening in the globe, right? So we want to reduce global warming. Refrigerants are insanely powerful global warming gases. So if we take back, say, uh, you know, if we interrupt the, the carbon emission cycle in a building by taking all the gas appliances out but, and we put in heat pumps, but then the heat pumps are leaking, we can be as bad off um, very quickly as if we had never done the work, right? So to avoid undermining our own work, we have to understand refrigerants, how they affect the environment, how to deal with them. Um, and then there's some design and installation stuff we'll cover. Then we have a section, in, um, the last section is about heat pump water heaters by themselves. And then we have um, 15 minutes for question and answer at the end. Um, if you put questions in the chat box as we're going, if, um, if I'm able to answer them, I will. If not, we'll see them at the end. So feel free to, to put things there. I have a lot to do and only the 90 minutes, so I'll deal with them if I feel like I'm on track. And if not, I'll save them all to the end. Um, okay, so first question, first section, what is a heat pump? I thought a bunch about how to make, well, first, I taught a class about heat pumps for, I don't know, it was like a three hour class. And at the very end of the class, somebody said, hey, so what is a heat pump anyway? Um, 
And I felt like a fool because I hadn't really made that clear. So I want to make sure that we kind of wrap our heads around what the technology is in the first place. Um, and so this, uh, this photograph is of a sort of college size refrigerator with microwaves sitting on top of it in a closet just outside my office door. Um, the refrigeration cycle we'll look at in another slide is something we've been using forever, right? We, uh, we evaporate a liquid and we condense a vapor and that process of evaporating absorbs a lot of heat. You could say boiling instead of evaporating and condensing releases a lot of heat. And so if you're just in control of where evaporation happens, you can absorb heat from somewhere. And if you're in control of where condensation happens, you can release the heat somewhere else. And so that's what refrigerators do. That's what air conditioners, refrigerators, dehumidifiers, the air conditioner in your car, that's what they're doing. It's the same technology. We've been using it for, I don't know, a really long time. I actually was going to say forever, but that's not true, right? I don't know. And somebody out there knows exactly when it started. It was like 50, 60, 70 years, right? This is not a new process. Um, somebody figured out that if we could flip-flop where the boiling and where the evaporation happen, then we could reverse the functions, right? Like, so when you're air conditioning, you boil a liquid inside the machine, inside the house, and you're absorbing heat from house, the house. And then you take that liquid or that vapor after you boil the liquid outside and you condense it and you release the heat. If we could set up a machine that did the condensing inside and the boiling outside, they would be absorbing heat from outside and releasing the heat inside. And that's the difference between an air conditioner and a heat pump. The heat pump is two directions of heat flow and the air conditioner is just one. And what makes all of that possible is this valve right here. This, um, this valve simply changes the direction of flow of refrigerant inside the what would have been an air conditioner. So inside the heat pump outside. And so heat pumps are typically an inside unit and an outside unit. So in the, in, within the outside portion, we've added this three-way valve and it simply just changes the direction of refrigerant flow, which flip-flops the, fun, the functions. Now we're absorbing heat from the outside and releasing it on the inside. And that's what a heat pump does as opposed to an air conditioner, right? So while the, um, all of the people who are trying to motivate the world, lobbyists and, and program people and all that stuff are talking about these machines like they're, they're incredible. Um, keep in mind that they're not really that new and they're not really that different. They just are very effective. So this is the cycle that I was just describing and waving my hands around and potentially losing you folks. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you're seeing what is the outside portion of an air conditioning system. On the left-hand side of your screen, you're seeing what is the inside portion of an air conditioning system. So this piece is typically a furnace um, and an air conditioner. You see them in hall closets, in garages, in attics, and in crawl spaces in parts of California. This is that sort of big cube that sits outside in the yard and makes all kinds of noise. Um, in air conditioning, you're condensing a lick or vapor over here. So you're sending a vapor in, in this pipe. A compressor compresses it and makes it really hot, but it's still a vapor. And then outside air is pulled through a coil and cools it to the point where it condenses back to being a liquid. The liquid leaves the system down here in the thinner of the two pipes. Um, and you'll see that that's around 100 degrees and the, the vapor going into the system was around 50 degrees. Um, so we now have this hot liquid and it runs through a line set. This little section between sort of the two units, this can be like 80 feet long, right? Like this is all of that plumbing that goes from the outside of the building to the inside of the building to wherever the furnace and air conditioner have historically sat and the liquid comes in, it goes through what's called a metering device, which lowers its pressure 
When you lower pressure, there's an associated loss or drop in temperature. And so this 100 degree liquid all of a sudden gets to be very cold. So we're at sort of 20 degree liquid now. It enters the evaporator coil, which is the part of the air conditioner you see inside the house, and it boils off because it's only 20 degrees and the house air is like 80 degrees, right? And that raises the temperature of the liquid into the 40s where its boiling point is and it boils off. That cycle, pardon me, is very confusing for people initially. And I don't know if my description of it in really basic terms has helped or not. Um, <clears throat> it took me probably about a year and a half from when I first started working on heat pumps and air conditioners to where I really understood this process. Um, it's just not quite like anything else. Um, but having said that, it's not very hard to interact with. And, and especially with the higher efficiency pieces of equipment, there's sort of less for the technicians to do. Now, the difference between an air conditioner, excuse me, and a heat pump is that valve, right? That reversing valve, three-way valve that I mentioned earlier, it's right here in this photo. So hot vapor leaves this compressor right here and it gets to that valve and it's pushed into the coil on the outside of the building, which means we're in air conditioning, right? And it cycles around, it's a hot liquid, the pressure is reduced, now it's a cold liquid, then it boils off, and now it's a vapor, and it comes back and it's rooted like this into the compressor and it gets compressed and heated up. And so the cycle repeats. If this valve were to rotate so that the angle was this way, the direction of flow would be reversed and now you would be heating the building, right? And, and that's it. That's what makes a heat pump a heat pump instead of an air conditioner. This is a photo of, uh, I normally do this as a question, but. Uh, doing for time. Um, and in any case, this is a variable capacity heat pump. I usually make people guess a bunch to, to tell me why this is happening, but I'm worried I won't have time. So um, what you're seeing right here is frost. The frost is developing on the outside unit because the unit is absorbing heat from the outside air. The refrigerant is boiling in that coil but it's boiling at like 20 degrees, right? And it's maybe 45 degrees outside. So it's so cold at its boiling point where it's absorbing heat that the moisture in the outside air is condensing and then freezing on the coil. And so you'll see heat pumps do this, they get frosty. And the other thing you can tell from this photo is this is a variable capacity heat pump. Um, and the way that you can tell is it has this great big coil and only a little bit of it has frost on it. So the machine's not doing a lot of work right now, right? And the variable capacity machines have much higher efficiency or, or you know, one of our sort of most important um, uh, improvements that have been made in heat pump technology in the last, I don't know how many years. These are, we're gonna see this again, these are um, legacy heat pumps, meaning that they're, Oh, they're an older style. They're still available for sale. They're less complicated, um, generally a little less expensive, but not a lot, um, and, uh, and work extremely well, right? Like they're just not as efficient as the variable capacity machines. So how do we use these machines? Um, there's, there's sort of like two, I mean, there's all the things that I talked about already, right? Like um, refrigeration and dehumidification. But for our perspective, the two important uses we need to talk about are space conditioning and water heating. And under space conditioning, we have the two machines that I just showed you, which are um, single speed or two speed legacy machines. And so legacy essentially means that the wiring, control wiring, is a series of somewhere between three and eight circuits. And the circuits are all on off switches, right? Like if they're powered, the circuit board that receives that signal and it does something. If they're not powered, 
the circuit board's not receiving the signal and it does something else. They're just sort of like on off commands. Super easy to put together and install um, in the sense that that command system is not very complicated. People run into trouble because there can be as many as eight commands and they get mixed up about what all the commands are, right? But um, ultimately the system itself is, is relatively simple. Um, then we have multi-speed and variable speed communicating systems. That picture where we saw the coil that was only partially frosted up, that's a variable speed communicating system. And it has much, much higher efficiency um, because it, it has this sort of operational range um, that goes down from like, uh, I don't know, maybe 30% of its total capacity up to its full capacity. So its electrical consumption can reduce really, you know, down to like, I don't know, a third of its, it's actually less than a third, it's not linear. So like a, a machine might be able to drop its electrical consumption down to sort of 300 watts. Um, and then it could also ramp its electrical consumption up to over 2000 watts, right? So there's this huge range of electrical consumption available and we want the machine to only consume as much power as necessary in any given situation. And that's what the variable capacity and multi-speed communicating machines can do. Um, under that sort of uh, communicating, oh, sorry, communicating commands. <clears throat> Instead of being like six or eight wires that are on off commands, there's two or three wires and they use a pulse command strategy. And so the circuit boards are using a pattern of electrical pulses to talk to each other. And there's nothing that an installer can do with it. You, you literally just, you connect a two or three wire um, lead on to one machine and then to the other machine. And then uh, that's it, right? Whereas in the single speed things, if you don't connect all six or eight wires properly, you'll end up with the machine misbehaving. And so I said that the single speed community or the single speed communication system was simple, but people got confused by it sometimes. Um, the communicating systems are extremely complicated. They're very hard for the technician to sort of change the behavior of the equipment, but at, at install, they're super easy. You just, you take this wire and hook it up over there and hook it up over there and you tell the thing to turn on, right? Because all of that sort of commissioning and design stuff is all been done by the manufacturer. So it ends up being an advantage for, um, for us for the most part. And under this communicating um, heading, we have ductless mini splits and ducted mini splits. And I'll show you pictures of exactly what I mean. And then in water heating systems, there's basically two categories. There's split systems where there's a heat pump outside and a tank inside. And there's unitary systems where there's a tank inside and a heat pump mounted right on top of it, right? And, uh, and that's pretty much it for variation in water heating at the moment. Um, we may see other ideas come, come along, but that's how they are now. All right, so this is a single speed legacy unit, right? Like, again, it just kind of looks like a cube in the yard. It might have one speed, it might have two speeds, but it's basically um, those on off circuits. And its efficiency tops out at about SEER 16. SEER is a rating. Um, in BTUs per watt under a test condition used to, re to rate um, air conditioners in particular. And uh, it's not super useful for you to say, okay, I'm gonna get this 16 sphere machine and it's gonna lower the energy consumption at my customer's house by some specific number, but it's super useful for comparison, right? If you're looking at a 16 sphere machine and a 25 sphere machine, the 25 SEER machine is significantly more efficient, right? So knowing the SEER number and comparing the different options, you always want to go for the highest SEER you can get using it as sort of a relative scale. Um, this is a heat pump class and the picture I have has a furnace in it. And that's because, pardon me for one second, um, there are hybrid machines out there. And this is a machine made by Carrier. I forget 
I can't remember what the what the carrier line is, infinity maybe, where they do this. And so this is a high efficiency communicating um, heat pump. It just happens to be paired with a furnace. And for the most part, this is just expensive and complicated. Um, we don't, it's rare that we really need a gas appliance and an electrical appliance doing the same job. Um, as we switch to heat pumps for most of our customers, um, pure heat pump is the way to go. The only argument for this sort of gas electric hybrid would be in a scenario where um, the, the customer couldn't have solar, um, their, their cost, their dollar cost for operation got really high for electricity and they would want to shift to gas heat, but it's 99% of the time that argument doesn't hold up. So I've completely stopped installing this system. Um, I do have one or two jobs a year where uh, there's no, no generation of any kind um, and we end up doing a gas and you know gas heat and air conditioner scenario. Um, but it's only sort of when we're forced, right? Like when there's just no way they can have any kind of generation. So what I want you to get out of this is that the communicating systems can look like the legacy systems um, and that the sort of better communicating systems tend to be the mini split style machines, which you'll see soon. Um, the highest efficiency machines out there are ductless mini splits, right? So no duct system of any kind. Um, and you can get them in single head versions where there's one outside unit and one inside unit, or you can get them in multi-head systems where there's one outside unit and as many as like six or seven inside units. Um, but there's an efficiency consequence to the multi-head machine, right? Like so single head sear goes from 19 to 30, multi-head sear goes from 18 to 22. If you have a customer um, that's pursuing the higher sear, um, I mean, that's pursuing an energy efficient building, you'd want to pick the higher sear machine. Um, and somebody just asked me what sear was, so I'll um, go over that again. Sear is um, seasonal energy efficiency ratio. It's based on a test that um, all of the air conditioning systems are rated with before sale, right? So like all of the machines you can buy have this rating number. And the test has no real um, bearing on air conditioning conditions in California. And so these numbers are in BTUs delivered per watt of power consumed. And the number is super useful because if you came to me and said, Dan, I want to have the most energy efficient house I can possibly have. I'm gonna see if I can keep the sear closer to 30. If you came to me and said, I'd like to significantly improve the energy efficiency of my house, but I have some significant budget limitations, I might go to a multi-head system where I can do more of the house with just the one machine and accept that the sear is going to be 22. Now, neither the 22 or the 30 tell you what the ultimate energy consumption is going to be. You just know going in that the 30 is more efficient than the 22, right? Um, and the reason that they're not uh, direct, um, like you can't calculate very directly how much power will be consumed is there's too many other variables. Like this test is not great for California and there's other things about the building that are involved. Um, but relatively, it allows you to compare machines. Um, so, ductless, right? I said that there were ductless mini splits, and then I'd show you a picture. This is a Mitsubishi system. Mitsubishi, Daikin, Cree, Panasonic, Fujitsu. There's tons of options out there. And when you're looking at them, one of the simple ways to sort them is look at the efficiency. Look at the SEER number and see if it's telling you it's high SEER or low SEER. Um, there's another thing about this that we'll pick up again later in the talk, which is simply that this is not ducted, right? Which means it's in a space and it conditions the space that it's in very effectively. There are other rooms in the building typically like around the corner 
And this machine will do a much worse job conditioning wounds that it can't actually see. The better the building enclosure gets, the less important that distinction is, um, but it's something to keep in mind, right? Like this is a, basically a space conditioner in the sense that it's conditioning the space that it's in, whereas other machines can, like a ducted system, could reach into more parts of the house. Um, this is an installed multi-head. You see how there's eight lines right here? It might be a little hard to count. There are eight lines right there. Those are um, pairs of copper tubes that run the refrigerant from the outside unit to the inside unit. This house has um, sort of a downstairs guest suite that has one head wall head in it. The master bedroom suite has one wall head in it. The kitchen living room area has one wall head in it. And the um, uh, office in the house has one ceiling cassette in it, you'll see that. And so this system does a relatively good job of conditioning the whole house because it has multiple heads. To do that with higher efficiency, we would actually have had to put four systems in. And, and that was one of the options we talked about with this customer, allowing them to choose between sort of the highest efficiency and good but lower efficiency. Um, and the trade-off they made wasn't ultimately because of cost, right? You would think that the four systems would cost so much more than the one system that they would pick the one system. The cost is lower for the multi-head system, but not so much lower that it makes it a deal breaker. The deal breaker was space, right? There's no place to put four outside units in this particular yard. And so we ended up doing the four head multi-head so that we didn't sort of take over all of their useful outside space. This is the ceiling cassette in the gentleman's office. Um, and this is it sort of like ready to go into the ceiling. That's uh, upside down in this photo. So you can see that you're looking down at what you would be looking up at in the room. Um, this is it installed with its grill on the top. These machines are designed to be in um, drop ceilings in commercial buildings. And so they're not really set up to maintain the air barrier in a building. You've had a couple, you've had the opportunity to take a couple of other talks about high performance buildings. And so someone should have already talked about the value of an air barrier in a building. So the air barrier in a building is the separation between the space that's inside where the people are and the space that's outside. When you have an effective air barrier, you have a very energy efficient building and things like um, you know, wildfire smoke, like I'm surrounded by at the moment, stay outside and don't migrate into the building very quickly. It's, it's an important portion of how high performance building performs. And this machine is a whole. There's no way to seal this machine very effectively into the building's air barrier. So what you're seeing in this photo a little dark maybe, but hopefully you can make it out, is that there's truss cords here and truss cords there. And the machine is sitting between the truss cords and we've built a foam board box around a little air handling unit that is that ceiling cassette. And we'll close off the front of it with another piece of foam board. So when this machine is all done, it's sitting in literally a little bubble of house air, right? It's part of the building's air barrier, it's inside, and we've expanded the air barrier to encompass it. Pardon me. These are ducted systems. This is a slim duct system, meaning it's a very small air handler. Um, uh, heating and cooling capacities go from 7,000 BTUs per hour up to about 18,000 BTUs per hour. This is what's called a mid-static air handler, so same shape as this one but bigger, right? Both taller and sort of thicker. Um, and the capacities in these go from like a ton and a half, 18,000 BTUs per hour up to three tons, 36,000 BTUs per hour. And then this is called a multi-position air handler. And it looks kind of like our old furnaces. Um, the multi-position air handlers have an even larger capacity. They go from sort of like two tons up to maybe five tons. And so we now have 
communicating variable capacity, high efficiency heat pump systems in this like size range from tiny up to really pretty big, like um, say a five ton system. I've never installed a five ton system. They're bigger than the need of any house that I've done so far. Um, partially because I don't oversize, we do uh, load calculations and install appropriately sized systems. So um, the available high efficiency equipment at the moment covers the whole spectrum of what you might need. Then you just kind of end up shifting equipment choices as you work through different designs. This is a unitary heat pump water heater. So down here is the water. And then up here is the heat pump. And there's an element in the middle that is basically a refrigerant, to refrigerant coil, right? So the high temperature vapor refrigerant is being pushed through a coil that's submerged in the liquid. And the liquid is cooling the vapor down to its condensing point. Um, and the, um, sorry, I'm just doing two things at once. Um, anyway, so the, the liquid it cools down, it condenses, it releases the heat. And I was thinking about condensing and, and what temperature that would be happening at. Since the water temperature is heated to around 130 degrees, maybe as much as 150 degrees, in these machines, they're set up so the condensing temperature of the vapor is probably around 150, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and uh, which is just a tidbit, right? Like you're not going to really do anything with that information, other than understand that by varying the pressures, the manufacturers can make either boiling or condensing happen at very, very cold temperatures or very, very hot temperatures. So they can absorb heat when it's 20 degrees outside, right? And they can um, condense the, the vapor and release heat when it's very, very hot. Right? And it's just a question of, of how the machine is programmed to maintain pressures. This is another um, diagram of the heat pump system. And so, this is, this is from a split system. So it's laid out like there's a tank inside and a heat pump outside. And from the perspective of how the system works, it really doesn't matter if one piece is outside and one piece is inside or whether they're stacked on top of each other. What you have going on here is refrigerant boiling off and absorbing heat from the outside air. And so that's air to refrigerant heat exchange. And then here in that heat exchanger, I told you drops down into the tank, you have the vapor condensing and releasing heat to the water. So you have refrigerant to water heat exchange. Um, and so in the split system, there's water plumbing between the tank and the heat pump in the um, unitary systems. They're all one unit and they're sort of stuck together. And let's see, I'm going to back up to this discussion. Pardon me. I was talking about tons of capacity and sizes of equipment. So we've been talking about air conditioning and heat pumps for a very long time um, using a metric called tons. And it relates back to before compressor-based air conditioning, somebody <clears throat> needed to cool air, right, and, and preserve food and whatever else, so they used ice. And it turns out that in order to melt a one-ton block of ice, you have to add 12,000 BTUs of hour for a 24-hour period in order to convert the entire block of ice from ice to water. And that particular nugget came forward in the sort of nomenclature from when we used ice to when we started using compressors. And so now compressor, condenser, well, just the whole air conditioning system is rated at how many BTUs of cooling or heating it can do and in an hourly um, metric. And so 
the BTUs per hour that they're all have a number, like 12,000 BTUs per hour, 6,000 BTUs per hour, 9,000 BTUs per hour, 60,000 BTUs per hour. If you take those numbers and divide them by 12, that's where we get the tons from. So 36,000 BTUs per hour divided by 12,000 BTUs per hour is a three ton air conditioner. Um, and it's just linguistics, right? Like it's just how um, the language followed the technology as it evolved. So more tons is more work. If you were to do a load calculation for a home, it will tell you I need 26,000 BTUs per hour to air condition this house at peak conditions. It'll also tell you that I need 29,000 BTUs per hour to heat this house at peak conditions. And so those are just over two tons, right? 24,000 BTUs per hour is two tons, 26,000 BTUs per hour is like 2.1 tons. Um, and so that's how we talk about the equipment. When you're actually making those decisions, doing a load, cal load calculation and picking equipment, you're gonna look into what's called expanded data and it'll all be in BTUs per hour. And I'll show you that later. Um, so tons is sort of like a general way to talk about things. Then there's real specific design information we also have to look at. Uh, let's see, I jumped, I did that. And so, okay, so here's our heat pump examples. On the left is a unitary system. And so the tank is there the water to refrigerant heating coil is here. The refrigerant to air heating coil is up here. And there's a compressor and um, valves and things in there. And this particular unit is in a confined space, right? This room is too big or too small for the amount. It doesn't contain enough air for the machine to be able to absorb enough heat. So. What we have in this particular scenario is a vent to outside. When the machine operates, air is sucked through here, and then the air goes through this coil. It changes the temperature of the refrigerant. The refrigerant goes down here and it heats the water, and then the air is ejected through this duct to outside. This is how you deal with a heat pump when you don't have enough space for it to absorb heat. There's a, there's a body of ambient air required around the machine. Um, and I've been called out to look at heat pumps by people who were pissed. You know, this heat pump doesn't work. I don't know. They lied to me. It's always been a piece of crap. All kinds of things they say. Um, and every time that I've been in that scenario, the machine was installed like in a closet with no access to, to air where it could absorb heat. So, of course, it doesn't work. Right. It has to be able to get the heat from somewhere. This is a split system. This is a sand and split system heat pump water heater. Um, these are cool. They use carbon dioxide as the refrigerant. So the refrigerant has much lower global warming potential than the other machines. <coughs> this one is actually mounted in a carport. And so it's, uh, it looks like it's inside, but it's not. Um, there's a wall here and a wall here and a roof. And then the other two sides are open. So it's not, um, it's not restricted. And then this, you know, the Danger Will Robinson looking thing um, is a tank. And the water is circulated from this tank through these two pipes to this machine where it's heated. And so the, the cold water goes out here, goes to the machine, it's heated through the connections right there. Then it goes back and it's dropped in the top of the tank. The rest of what you're seeing here, pardon me, um, is... Uh, Distribution plumbing. Um, all right, and I'm, I apologize about this, but I have to sneeze really bad. I'm gonna get up for just a second. I'll be back as quick as I can. Sorry that um, this is happening. I'll be right back.
Okay, sorry about that. I um, mentioned this in the beginning, but some of you may not have heard it. I'm either suffering from prolonged smoke inhalation or I started getting sick. Um, I think it might actually be the smoke. There's a big wildfire right near here. So um, I feel bad to interrupt you. But anyway, that's why I had to jump up. <clears throat> anyway, um, I explained unitary and split. And so I was making jokes about um, the sort of Will, you know, Danger Will Robinson, the um, robot from Lost in Space is kind of what this reminds me of. And what you're seeing there actually is plumbing designed for low resistance to water flow. Plumbers um, and contractors and pretty much everybody else like really sort of um, visually organized things, right? Like um, what looks really great in a mechanical room, are rows of pipes, and then they all sort of turn, right? Like, you know, they maintain the same distance away from each other and they're super organized looking, they're usually not insulated. When we do that, there's a high degree of assembly skill in evidence on the hand, on the part of the plumber who built it, right? Like those are very good, very good work. From the perspective of moving water and moving heat, it's a terrible way to do it. Um, we have huge amounts of heat loss because the pipes are generally not insulated well. And every time we make a hard bend, we're creating resistance to water flow, so we're increasing pumping energy. This strategy that looks you know, and, and I know it looks terrible, right? Like the, I built, I didn't plumb this house, but I built this portion of the plumbing and the general plumber was he just was so upset that he had to hook up to this. Um, but you'll notice that there's no sharp bends, right? Like everything is a radius bend. So that it's literally bent plastic pipe. Um, and what you end up with is very little resistance to water flow. So this is a higher efficiency plumbing strategy um, there's a gentleman who will come up in the slides later named Gary Klein, um, who's done a ton of research about this and teaches classes about how to do it as well. Um, this is a new thing that uh, I don't know what to think about. There's some research about these um, that uh, <clears throat> I just heard about. I haven't had a chance to read yet. This is a 110 volt heat pump water heater. All the other ones that I showed you were 220 volts. And so they have less, at, this machine has less access to electrical power than the other machines do. And as a result, it can make less hot water in any given time window than the other machines. And what's exciting about these is a homeowner could install this themselves um, or a contractor who didn't have the ability to work on the electrical system could install this because it just plugs into a wall plug, right? And it has a built-in circuit breaker in its cord. So if, it, you know, if it's drawing too much power or there's a short or something, it should trip itself up. So it has some added safety. Um, I have this mental, because I'm a contractor and I like to build things, um, even when they look odd to people, in a way that I feel is very thorough. I have this mental picture of these things showing up in garages with extension cords all over the place, which is potentially not a good thing, but this does open some options. And I suspect um, that these are gonna work really well. And as soon as, uh, as soon as I can get a hold of the research, I'll see what the field research looks like. But this is an option for you. I would, I would use one of these, right? Like I would try to do the 220 volt machine first. And if I couldn't, I would do the lower capacity 110 volt machine. So I'm not saying don't use these. I'm just saying that uh, um, because they're accessible to people who are not contractors, I'm expecting some odd installs to show up. And that's not bad. It just is what it is. So that's the difference that it has a 110 volt plug, um, requires a 20 amp, 120 volt circuit, and its capacity is around 12,000 BTUs per hour, one ton per hour. Um, which is a little lower than the other machines. Benefits of heat pumps. Oh, good. We're doing fine on time. Um, remember I said in the beginning, the sort of uh, political people and program people were talking about these machines like they were magic. And it's this zero carbon thing that's got them all excited, right? Like they 
are pursuing removing gas from the state's infrastructure. And it's a good idea, right? Like leaking methane gas from our sort of methane plumbing system is a significant global warming gas, right? It has a significant impact on the future of the climate. Combusted natural gas and propane is also contributing negative to the future of the climate, right? Like, so if we can move away from combustion, we have the potential to improve global warming significantly. And these machines have no combustion. They use no natural gas, no propane. So they have a really significant advantage in that regard. Um, depending on how successful the sort of climate lobby is, the ultimate goal is to shut the natural gas off completely, right? And so if you accept that that might be an outcome, which I do, um, all the gas machines that exist are in trouble, right? Like we're gonna be out there replacing the last sort of gas furnaces because they're gonna be turning the gas off. Um, so I don't know how quickly that'll actually happen, but I do think that that's in our future. So taking heat pumps seriously um, is important at this point in time. And then this last statement is complicated and we're gonna look at it briefly. Heat pumps are so much more efficient than gas appliances, they can be cheaper to operate even without generation. Although, because of the cost structure or how much behind how much we charge for electricity, it's frequently the case that a direct swap from gas to electric will not lower the customer's electric bill. I have a friend who has a company in the East, uh, East Bay around San Francisco. And uh, he's really good about checking his assumptions and checking his own work. And it's a larger company, they do quite a bit of work. And so he went back and he researched um, installed energy efficiency. So like how much energy was actually consumed after retrofits in his projects. And then he looked at customers out of pocket fuel cost pre and post retrofit, right? So now he knows that the customer was spending this much money a year on water heating and this much money for heating and this much money for cooling. And then his company came in and they, they pretty much always do air sealing, insulation and convert the house to new heat pump system with new ducts. Um, and they're very well installed. They're buried in insulation. They pay attention to a whole bunch of the performance factors around installing systems well. Um, and so then, you know, so that's the package that he's looking at. And in most of them, the energy efficiency, the amount of energy consumed is significantly less, right? They, the, they met their goals around reducing total energy consumption and they met their goals around carbon emissions because they're, they've taken out gas consumption and replaced it with electrical heat pump operation. And then in most of those instances, the customer's out-of-pocket billing is up somewhere between 10 and 30%. And that's because electricity costs more. So they, and, and I've had other customers with the same scenario. We reduced their energy consumption by 50% and their out-of-pocket cost was up 30%. Now, if the whole scope includes adding generation of some kind, it blows that all out of the water, right? As soon as you can generate power on site, then a whole bunch of the electrical consumption shifts to what you're generating and the cost of operation goes way, way, way down. So I have other customers that are spending like, I don't know, a hundred bucks a year, right? Like next to nothing because um, they're basically paying the um, annual or like the monthly surcharge to have a system and they're not really paying anything out of pocket for the, the cost of energy consumption, right? And so these distinctions are important for people to sort of wrap their heads around. Um, and the customer, oh, and by the way, in all cases, the customers that I described that had higher out of pocket cost and lower energy consumption, they were all happy about it because they were motivated by comfort, air quality, and climate change, 
right? And so they knew because we were honest with them about how this works, that they can convert to heat pumps and improve their building enclosures. And if they didn't add generation, they might spend a little more on the cost of power. And they were all, okay, great. And they did it. And some of them added PV and some of them didn't. So this is how um, we can illustrate how the machines behave, right? Different types of equipment. So for easy comparison, the way that this particular example is laid out is in um, cost to deliver 1 million BTUs of heat to a space, right? So the efficiency of the equipment is one factor. And so I wanna point these things out. So the first example is an 80% furnace, right? So that 80% in this math here is the equipment efficiency. And, and these are ducted systems. So after the piece of equipment, there's a distribution system. So the distribution system, typically, you can do way better than this, but typically installed duct systems lose about 50% of the capacity of the conditioning that's pushed through them. So you have initial fuel, 80% efficiency of the equipment, so you lose 20% right there, and then 50% efficiency in your ducts, so you lose 50% of what came out of the machine. So it costs... $58 per million BTUs of heat with an 80% furnace and sort of typical ducts in an attic. Um, and then earlier when we were talking about these slides, somebody said, hey, how much gas is 1 million BTUs? 1 million BTUs of gas is 10 therms. And right before class, I logged into one of my customers um, and looked at their energy consumption pre-retrofit. And they were using between six and 68 therms per month, right? And so six therms was just water heating only in the summer, 68 therms was uh, monthly gas consumption, right? So this 1 million BTUs is 10 therms. It's not very much gas, right? So this is $58 per million BTUs, which is roughly 10 therms. And we're using million BTUs because we can also look at electricity. So if you went into this particular house and you swapped out their 80% furnace with a 95% furnace and replaced the duct system, you making a smaller duct system and burying it in insulation, you could drop that 50% loss to, you know, raise it from 50% to 85%. So you're now lower it from 50% to 15% is what I'm trying to say. The loss portion in the ducts was half. Now it's only 15%. Right, so you now have 95% combustion efficiency, 85% duct system efficiency. Um, and uh, the energy cost for your 1 million therms goes from $58 to $28. And what this is illustrating is even with lower efficiency machines like gas equipment, the, the whole system is incredibly important, right? Like, you have to deal, if it's a ducted system, you have to deal with the equipment and the system, the ducts, in order to get to a good end goal. Um, and I'm going to talk about how to build good duct systems um, later. And unfortunately, it's like a, it's a topic, right? Like we can spend days on how to duct well, but we have some sort of uh, digest slides that will go over what those principles are. Um, as an introduction, the duct system that is more efficient is generally smaller in size, not duct diameter size, like footprint size. So we redesign the system, pulling everything towards the center of the house. We use higher R value ducts. We use um, traditional insulation products to insulate over the duct system to make sure that it's well insulated. Um, and then we make sure that they're airtight, right? So no duct leakage. And, and we'll, we'll cycle back to that. But that's the difference between 50% losses with ducts in an attic and 15% losses with ducts in an attic. So a huge improvement by making the system better. If we go to heat pumps, we can do the same thing, right? And so the, uh, 
There's two different efficiency numbers represented in here. So HSPF, heating specific performance factor of 12 is a rating and it has a COP, which is um, coefficient of performance. The COP is basically how many times better than electric resistance would this be? Um, and so this has a COP of 3.6. And so, and, and um, heat pumps sort of range from like one and a half to five in terms of how many times better than electric resistance they are, um, depending on conditions, right? Like when the heat pump is heating and it's really, really cold outside, its COP goes down to like one and a half to two. And if it's heating on a mild day where there's tons of ambient heat outside, it goes up to like five, right? So you have this range of potential efficiencies. So this 3.6 or 360% is a pretty fair multiplier. And these are good ducts, right? Like you don't want to do bad ducts. So when you do our heat pump for 1 million BTUs, the metric for energy is now kilowatt hours instead of therms of gas. Pardon me, 293 kilowatt hours is equal to 1 million BTUs. You get the efficiency in gas was either 80 or 96%, now it's 360%, and we have some duct losses. And so our annual energy consumption cost is $27 per million BTUs. And you would have to know for the year how many million BTUs you used. Pardon me. Um, there's this other thing that we can do, especially with heat pumps, and I'll explain why later. It has to do with the, the physical size of the equipment itself, which is move the system from like the attic or the crawl space into the inside of the building enclosure. And when we do that, our thermal losses go away, right? Like when we have ducts in an attic, when we lose heat from the duct system, it's lost to outside the house. When we have a duct inside the house, when we lose heat through the duct, it's lost to inside the house where we were trying to heat anyway. So we get this initial bonus where we go from 15% losses to no losses if we can bring the equipment inside the house. And with the mini split ducted systems, this is becoming more and more possible. And I'll show you some pictures. This is a cautionary slide, right? Like if we take that same heat pump, because the problem with all of this is nobody likes complexity, right? The, the people who are saying you should do heat pumps are also saying things like you should just do heat pumps, worry about the details later, right? And you're going to do your customers a disservice if you do that. And that's sort of what this example is. If you do what's called a box swap, where you take the exit, they, they call them boxes, right? Because the furnace is a long rectangular box and the evaporator coil is like a little cube. Those, if you take those two boxes out and you put heat pump boxes in place of them, but you don't make any of the duct improvements and you go back to this math, you've got your 360% equipment efficiency, but you still have 50% duct losses and you have an expensive fuel, electricity is expensive. So you end up with your saving, you know, your, your cost per million BTUs is $45. And the furnace you were replacing, if I go back three slides, was $58, right? So I could take a system that costs somebody $58 per million BTUs to operate and replace it with a system that costs $22 per million BTUs to operate, or, I can replace it with a system that costs $45 per million BTUs to operate, right? And if I'm promising big energy savings and I'm doing this, I'm not delivering them. And remember in the beginning when I said several of the customers that we looked at had um, increases in energy cost with huge decreases in, I mean, sorry, no, no, that's right. Increases in energy costs paired with huge decreases in energy consumption. Um, that occurs when the cost per kilowatt hour is higher than this, and which is quite common. So if you installed this system on a house where someone had significant electrical consumption already, which pushes their cost of fuel up by moving them into higher tiers for power consumption, 
this $45 per million BTUs will go up, right? And so this is the, the box swap concept with heat pumps is not is really never a great idea. What's great about heat pumps is they give us the ability to re-envision houses, especially when we look at the um, uh, mini split systems. Hold on, there's one thing I wanna see. Yep, I touched on that and we'll go back to it again later. Um, so this is actually a new house, like a two years, three years old, maybe right before COVID it was being done um, in Colorado. A friend of mine's company actually did this design and then they asked me to come and speak. And, and I said, I need to see some of your designs so we can talk about what you're doing. And they sent me this and I'm like, oh my God, <coughs> do you hate these people? Um, and then do you hate these people comment comes from the fact that there's the two things we have to think about. One is efficiency of the machine and one is the efficiency of the delivery system. And even if these ducts were um, relatively tight and reasonably well insulated, they're so freaking huge that they're losing capacity based on having too much surface area, right? So what we really wanna do is compact systems. We wanna move away from giant systems like this, right? And then the whole commercial world is a mess, right? Like we've been doing, I can't have you actually answer this question, but do you know why we do package units on roofs for commercial buildings? The answer is really cheap at time of install and commercial buildings frequently don't have um, large sort of interior mechanical spaces, right? And so there's some room for some ducts, but there's not necessarily like a lot of access for service and that sort of thing. So you put the equipment on the outside and you put the ducts in this little space on the inside, you can have <coughs> a really cheap to install system, which is this. And <clears throat> the efficiency of these systems is frozen in time unless you move away from combustion. They, um, because of some structural issues, the efficiency of gas fired, <coughs> furnace systems that are outside the building can't be higher than 80%. <clears throat> so we can't even move them to 95, 96% efficient, like our better combustion equipment. <clears throat> so if we abandon all of this and go to mini split heat pump systems, we can have condenser heat pump system, you know, units sitting outside, <clears throat> refrigerant lines that drop through the building enclosure and compact duct systems or ceiling cassettes or wall heads inside and all of this waste that's occurring outside the building goes away. This is an enormous area for improvement. <clears throat> and the other thing that we can start thinking about, remember in an earlier slide, I said one-to-one um, -one systems, one outside unit, one inside unit were higher efficiency. Um, because of that, and because the systems themselves can be very, very small, we can break a house into multiple zones and do each zone with a different piece of equipment. This is the house we did in the foothills of California. And it has, there's a deck here and these machines are under the deck and they blow sideways, right? So they're not blowing into the deck, they blow out from under the deck so they function well. And there's one heat pump for the first floor, a second heat pump, for the second floor and a third heat pump for a big um, home office. Individually controllable, high efficiency. Um, it's, you know, it's sort of like the best scenario. We can't always find enough space on the house to put in all these different machines. So we don't always get to do this, but when we do, this is, this is really a home run. This is another system like that. And it's showing the floor plan broken into zones from the load calculation software. And so this sort of pinkish area over here is one zone and it has a multi-head mini split um, out here. So there's one head there and another head there. So this pink area is one of the heads from the multi-split. This center area here is another head from the multi-split. The colors are unfortunate. These are not actually the same color, although they look like it. 
This area in the back, which is the owner's bedroom suite, has a mini split head there. And then all of the chopped up part of the house here, which is uh, one, two, two bedrooms, uh, a laundry, and, a, and then the master bath is on it as well, is on a ducted system. And the advantage of this particular strategy is they have highest efficiency possible through most of the house. And then in the portion of the house where there's individual rooms that would not be well conditioned by um, an, you know, a wall head, there's a ducted system that puts capacity into each space. And then the ducted system has the advantage of providing filtration, which has become a big deal in California first because of wildfires, and then secondarily because of COVID, being able to filter the air properly is a huge benefit for your customers. The wall heads and ceiling cassettes will not do it. They have horrible filtration. They do very little to protect the quality of the air um, other than they're capable of removing moisture. But they can't do anything about particulates. Um, whereas the ducted systems, we can put in giant effective filters. So I said this earlier that uh, the mini splits allow us to fit them into the building well. So this is a, a ducted mini split system. The return is to your left. The air handler is here and there's a supply plenum there. It's a new construction job. So there's a little easier to do, although we've done things like this in retrofit. Um, there's just gonna be drop ceiling in the closet in a mechanical space and over a little hallway. This entire duct system exists in this um, drop ceiling and it conditions um, this hallway that's out here, a bedroom there, um, sort of a closet and dressing area, shower and water closet, right? So it's just doing this little suite. Um, this is a super compact system. I don't love these um, because of noise potentially, and so what you're, the weird thing you're looking at here is, and it's super hard to get a photo of this. Um, so the angle is funky because it's so hard to photograph. Um, this is a giant metal plenum and it's the return side of the system, the side that's sucking air in. This is the opening in the air handler where the air enters, return opening. This is the air handler itself. The air handler butts up against the edge of this return plenum and there's a supply plenum stuck off the side of that. So there are four ducts that come off the air handler, but the air handler itself is actually inside the return so that the whole footprint of the system got shrunk. And, uh, and this is done, sort of, I think it's done in both high and sort of medium dollar jobs just to manage space. Um, I think, uh, it's sort of like difficult and fussy to install, but if you did this a few times, you could get very good at it and it makes for a super small footprint of system and allows you to squeeze it into a place in a building where you wouldn't normally have that option. So how and why do we pick different pieces of equipment, right? Like at some point you're gonna be offered this job or design and you gotta decide what to do there. Um, so we use ductless systems because they have the absolute highest efficiency of any heating and cooling product available to us, period, right? They are the pinnacle of efficiency we have available. Um, single head systems are more efficient than multi-head systems. Um, we use ducted systems when we have multiple portions of a building to, to condition sort of at the same time. And so in my last two, um, examples, one you saw the outside units and one you saw the floor plan. In both of those scenarios, there were ducted and non-ducted systems included because the ducted systems are good at conditioning the broken up portion of the house and the non-ducted, the ductless systems, are good at conditioning the big portions of the house. And so you kind of use a mix of both. And then I'm just going to touch on, there's a commercial variation um, within the equipment called VRF systems. They're very similar to mini splits and slightly lower efficiencies, but they're designed to have one sort of big outside unit and a lot of inside units. They're usually used in commercial scenarios and they can be useful for big houses. Um, 
I've only done uh, one VRF system. I've done tons and of different variations on mini split system. Okay, refrigerants. I've said this in a couple of different ways, but I want to make sure that it's really clear. <clears throat> the process that we're using for moving heat using heat pump systems is called phase change, right? And so this is the this is a slide that you might have seen like in high school, right? There's three phases of water, right? Phases of matter. Lots of different things can happen in these different phases. We're just used to water. So ice is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level or colder, right? And then water that is about to freeze is also at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the difference between 32 degree water and 32 degree ice is that you have to remove 144 BTUs per pound of the material. And so the variable that we're comparing that to is how much energy it takes to change the temperature of the water, right? So if we had 32 degree water and we wanted to get it to the point where it boils, we would have to add 180 BTUs per pound of water to get from 32 to 212. That probably just sounds like gibberish, right? A BTU is a British thermal unit. The definition of a BTU is how much energy it takes to change the temperature of one pound of water, one degree, right? So we talked earlier about tons of air conditioning. And so that was in 12,000 BTUs um, per hour. And we talked about the cost for heating, looking at different machines. And we were looking at a million BTUs. Um, this BTU unit is simply the amount of heat either added to or removed from a pound of water to change its temperature one degree. And so to get from 32 degrees to 212 degrees, you have to add 180 BTUs. Let's go back to my ice and water that's at the top here. When my water is 32 degrees and I want to freeze it, I have to remove another 144 BTUs, right? So I haven't changed temperature at all. I've changed state and I've removed a significant amount of BTUs compared to what it takes to change the temperature of the water. So let's look at water and steam. So now we've got our water at 212 degrees and we wanna make it into steam. So liquid water is all gone, right? It's become a vapor. In order to do that, we have to add 970 BTUs of heat to make it into a gas. And the whole refrigeration cycle, heating, cooling, heat pump cycle, is just taking our refrigerant instead of water and moving it from vapor to liquid and liquid to vapor. And the BTU content that is either absorbed or released as we go from water to, to vapor, I mean, from liquid to vapor or vapor to liquid is huge, right? And it's illustrated by this slide. So small BTU input or output to change the temperature huge BTU input or output to change phase, to change state from liquid to gas. And that's the underlying principle that allows these things to work. And we're not burning anything and we're not using methane, right? So all huge benefits, as long as the refrigerant doesn't leak. And so one of the presumptions, and, and this is great actually, because there's, there's this big working group um, across the country of, of smart people trying to figure out how to impact climate change. And they're starting to talk about, you know, how much leakage is there really, which is really encouraging because charging forward and into using refrigerants without talking about leakage can really hurt us. Um, so things that we need to sort of get used to is that leaking air conditioners and heat pumps, super, super common. One of the standard services that your annual service on your air conditioner um, is, is to check the charge and add some refrigerant. 
<clears throat> and it's super, super profitable, right? Like it's a great thing for the contractors. They sell you refrigerant at an enormous markup, but they only sell you a little bit so it doesn't freak anybody out. Their profit margin is really high and the cost of repairing the system properly is very, is expensive. So nobody's sort of pushing for fixing the leaks most of the time. So we're all kind of used to HVAC service, including a charge tune up, which is adding a little refrigerant and, and the systems are closed systems. So anything that gets out, anything you had to add is replacing something that got out. It shouldn't, we can't allow that to happen or else we have issues. Um, the global warming impact of the refrigerants is, is huge, right? Like carbon, the thing we talk about all the time has a global warming rating of one and everything else is rated as in how many times worse it is than that. The current refrigerant R410A is 2,088 times worse than carbon, right? So like releasing a little bit of it has a huge impact. So we need to focus on um, proper installation techniques and, uh, and changing sort of our service practices. And we'll talk about both of those things. Um, and then as a contractor, if you're moving into refrigerant systems, air conditioners and heat pumps, pardon me, um, leaks that occur in the warranty period where you can't bill the customer for it are expensive. You're looking at, you know, I don't know, six, six hours of time typically to fix a system. And it's, you know, you end up having to pay all that out of pocket. So leaks are very expensive for contractors. Initially, later service contractors can make a lot of money on them. So anyway, time to change procedures and do a better job about all of this. And so this is what I think uh, a refrigerant leak under the warranty period sort of costs a contractor. Um, Figure it's a four to eight hour service call if you're doing a good job and really verifying that there's no leaks as you finish. Um, so your direct labor cost is somewhere between $320 and $640. Um, that's what you're paying out of pocket. Um, assuming that your tech is paid around $80 an hour and you're billing them out around $150 an hour. Um, and then lost revenue for the company because that tech is not somewhere else working is somewhere between six and 1200 bucks. Right, so you're losing revenue by having your tech doing something remedial, and you're also paying the tech to do that. Um, the global warming uh, sort of piece of this is the truly scary piece of it. Um, we have leakage that we really can't do anything about during sort of manufacturer and reprocessing. So that's like the big facilities that are dealing with refrigerant. They're going to have some leaks. We can impact install and lifetime service, right, by doing our jobs well. And the problem with all of this is, while leaking refrigerants is, uh, is illegal, there's no real mechanism for managing it. So if you install a new system and it leaks a little bit, nothing is going to happen, right? Nobody's going to track that. Nobody's going to um, fine you. Nothing, nothing really comes of it. And a lot of contractors will um, end up dealing with it through their service and, and bill a homeowner for that anyway, and never and sort of duck the warranty cost. So there's no individual penalties, just sort of global penalties. And we're, and we're stuck in this process where um, it, it, right now, it requires that each of you take it on yourselves to say, this is a big deal. I'm not going to do this, right? Because there's no enforcing this under our current sort of metrics. Um, so these are to help you see like how big a deal this is, right? We talk about carbon and methane all the time as the global warming people. Carbon is at a global warming potential at 100 years um, at one. Methane is at 25. Nitrous oxide, which also comes from combustion is at 298. Um, R12, which is a refrigerant we stopped using because of ozone issues was really bad. It was at 10,000. R22 is a refrigerant we stopped using because of ozone issues. It was at 1800. Our current refrigerant that we're using is at 2090. I said 2088 before, depending on where you look, it varies a little bit, but it's over 2000. 
right? So 2,000 times worse than carbon. We can't afford to release it at all. Um, when we look at patterns, uh, greenhouse gas emissions related to refrigerants are sort of like the, the number one growing worry about the, you know, about where this is all headed. And as a state, we've set this target to, you know, to reduce our total carbon emissions, but we're only gonna pull it off if we manage refrigerants because there's such a problem. This is just a, like, again, to wrap your head around it, one pound of carbon, I'm sorry, let me say it this way. One pound of R410A has an impact at a hundred years, meaning it was worse and then it has gotten better. Um, at a hundred years from now has an impact of one ton of carbon, right? It's a huge multiplier. And uh, this is a spectrograph, which is, I don't know, not something that my brain naturally says, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. But what you're looking at is sort of energy um, in and out of the atmosphere in the form of ultraviolet light um, and heat and microwave radiation and all these different things. This area right here is this area right here. And the graph is showing that in that portion of the whole spectrum of how heat moves through the atmosphere is where heat can lead. Right And carbon and refrigerants act in that spectrum to reduce the sort of amount of heat can, that can leave in those wavelengths. And so the simple analogy is we have a door or a window in our world where we can let heat out. And the more stuff we release into the atmosphere, the more we close the window. Right? And we, our goal here is to reduce carbon emissions without letting refrigeration gases be emitted either. Um, so I said this earlier, I got sort of a little ahead of myself. There's no tracking of accidental, accidentally leaking systems. Um, and when I go out and talk to technicians, they know that what they're doing is important. Um, and they'll be doing like a test to make sure that refrigerants, you know, that the line set's gonna be tight. And they really aren't sure whether their system is passing the test or not. And so they'll do whatever it is for a while. And then they'll just go, okay, well, that's good. They don't have a clear pass fail. They don't have a clear like metric for did this system pass and is safe to use, or is this system going to be an issue? And, and I'm not trying to say these people are jerks. These are nice people that I have worked with and that I'm fond of that at their level of training and understanding had no idea if they were succeeding and their job was to build these things every day. Um, and this is the service example. And so we have all these other people, right? Not the people building systems, the people that fix existing stuff. And even if a system is not leaking, they're connecting to it with a gauge set, right? So they have a couple of hoses and a gauge in the middle, then they connect to an active system and they measure pressures and temperatures they figure out does it have enough refrigerant in it or not, and then they disconnect. And then they let the refrigerant out of their gauges because that's what they've been trained to do. And every time they do that, they're releasing three to nine ounces of refrigerant. So to be really conservative and make sure nobody gets too mad at me, I did the math for this example using one ounce of refrigerant leaked every time there's a service call. So you have a person and they go out and they connect to the system, they do their adjustments, they unconnect, disconnect, they release the refrigerant in their tool, and they've released one ounce of refrigerant. And that person goes to five places every day, and they go to, and they work five days a week. So they're releasing 25 ounces of refrigerant per week, which is equivalent to 1.63 tons of carbon. It's a huge amount of carbon being released by servicing air conditioners and heat pumps, right? We're over one and a half tons just by service. This isn't even a leak. This is just a service practice. Other practices of being developed where we test air conditioning and heat pump systems without hooking up to the refrigerant charge. And that's a step we need to take as when I talk about sort of new practices, we need to rely on actually hooking up to the refrigerant loop less than we used to in the past because it's impossible to do it without releasing refrigerant. Um, 
And there are better refrigerants headed our way. R32 is one example. Um, but it's still like the same practice would release a half ton a week. And this is per technician, right? So if there's a thousand techs in LA, that would be one would be 1,630 tons per week, right? Because this 1.63 is for one person. Oh God, sorry. I set a timer so that I would know that time was passing, but I didn't realize it was going to do that. Um, I thought it was just counting down. Uh, anyway, so other things that we can do that improve our practices with respect to line sets is use high pressure nitrogen testing. Um, so what you're seeing here is a nitrogen tank, um, and this is a line set being installed, and it's being tested at 600 psi as a pre-test. Um, Structurally, line sets are the, the thing that carries refrigerant from the outside unit to the inside unit. And the mini split systems use what are called flares. And flares are a mechanical connection that's super prone to leakage. The legacy systems are brazed, which is this process. And they brazing is a little easier to do without causing a leak than flaring is. But we have most of the new systems require flares. So we have to get good at this. This is an ASHRAE study. Um, they're an engineering organization and they were studying how good flares are. And they basically came to the conclusion that the flares leak, that, that there was, it was very hard to do flares that don't leak. And um, I don't think it's a great study. It doesn't have a large enough sample size, but the conclusion is something that I think might not be inaccurate. It's very hard to make these things so they don't leak, so we have to be really careful. So the first thing is your tools. You get an, a separate set of tools for working on the pipes. So contractors tend to use the same tools all the time, right? And uh, we end up um, using dull tools when we should be using sharp tools. And I am going over just a little bit. I apologize. Um, I'll uh, do my best to, to not run too far out. Um, so anyway, pipe cutters and reamers need to be sharp. Uh, this is a picture of a flare that was um, cut badly and then flared. And you can see this sort of concentric circle and rough edge. This leaked because it was made badly. Um, the tool we use for flaring is important. There's a drill mounted tool that's pretty effective. There's this older style. Um, mechanical flaring tool, which is very effective if used well. There are new, um, really expensive crimping tools on the market that potentially um, are going to be successful, but they're very expensive. And then there's this tool, which is a mechanical flaring tool. It's like a little robot that makes flares. Um, and it's pretty much as close to perfect as we can get. And they're not that expensive. So if you're new at this and you want to start off by doing a really good job, just buy this. Um, this involves like the least amount of sort of like tech, technician art in making these weird fittings. Um, it makes it repeatable and, uh, and it does a really good job over and over. There's some stuff out there like this, which are pressed together fittings. I think that uh, we should avoid these. Um, at the moment, there's no evidence that they work very well. Um, there are some sealants that are like little press-on things. I think we should also avoid these. Um, this is a weird thing. You can buy uh, a ready-made line set, and it comes with uh, the, a portion of the flare connection on the line set. It's a flare nut. The equipment manufacturers don't want us to use those. They're going to send stuff specific to their machines. They want us to use those. When you're making a flare, you put oil on the mating surface where the, the female and male portions of the flare connection come together so that the metals move effectively. There's um, a sealant you can put on the threads, although um, debate is out on whether or not this is necessary. Um, it's important that we use a torque wrench so that we set the tension in the flare properly. And these are torque wrenches that are available. And then we get into testing, right? I showed you this picture of using nitrogen pressure to test the system. 
So we test, depending on the manufacturer, 400 to 600 PSI, 450 to 600 PSI. Um, on new construction jobs, we frequently have to put the line sets in and then come back later to finish the job. So we always build the line set, braze it closed and pressurize it with nitrogen so that it's sitting in a clean, dry state. And then if someone punctures it, it blows off nitrogen and we get someone notifies us. So that's a system at rough install. This is the beginning of a nitrogen test. You can see it was pressurized to 579.5. And at 10 minutes, it's dropped to 577.7. And then it starts to level out. There's an um, equalization period where the temperature of the nitrogen sort of equalizes in the system. So your initial, you pressurize it and your initial numbers will shift, but then you should get a long period of, of no change. Um, this is measuring nitrogen, right? Like this is a little tiny analog gauge. This is a digital gauge and you can see it's 575, 77 PSI there and 455 PSI in that one. And this one is over 550. So just different tests. Here's some tests at 600. And, and that just depends on the manufacturer, right? Fujitsu says 600, other people say 450. We do what's called a vacuum test. This is a vacuum pump. And we're pulling all of the atmosphere out of the line set now. And we pull the, the vacuum down until it hits a target expressed in microns. And so the, um, you, want to, you want to be below 200 microns and stable when you shut the power or the pump off. So there's a valve right here that isolates the system from that pump. And then you let the gauge um, sit and you watch it for time. If the micron number goes up more than 100 microns, um, I use a half hour. I think we're calling for 15 minutes in the slides. Um, I just like to go longer. Uh, then, then it's a fail, right? Like the thing has to be able to sit stable for a long time. Um, and this is just a graph of that process. So this blue line is the microns and you'll see someone shut a valve here and the numbers started to rise. And so they opened the pump back up and let it pump. And you can see the next time they checked, it was much lower. And then they checked again, it was much lower. And then they actually shut the valve off and let it go through the decay test. And you can see in the time window where they're doing the test that it's only come up a little bit. And that's what we're looking for. This is just a graph of that process. And then after all that is passed, you release the refrigerant into the system and adjust the charge. For mini splits, the higher efficiency option, you use weight. So there's a bottle on a scale. This is a picture of a scale. And in this example, 14 ounces of refrigerant have left the bottle and gone into the system, right? So a decrease in weight on the scale is an increase in weight in the system. And what you're doing is you're letting the refrigerant out of the bottle on the scale into the mini split while it's still under vacuum, right? So it, the refrigerant wants to get sucked into the system. And there's a calculation provided by the manufacturer based on the length of the line set that tells you how much refrigerant you need to add. So uh, Ted had a question that'll get answered in this section, um, which we have to do pretty quickly, I apologize. Um, so these are all things that really need to be thought about, right? So we have um, load calculations are required. We need to know how much energy we have to deliver to different portions of the house, what the total airflow for a system needs to be. We need duct leakage to be zero, conductive losses to be as close to zero as possible. Um, the line set test thing that I just um, mentioned and refrigerant charge has to all sort of be considered at design and installation. Um, otherwise, we end up with systems like we have now, which are operating at about 50% losses. This is the load calculation. Um, uh, metric that's sort of accepted across the industry. It's from ACA, which is a trade organization, and the, the calculations are called Manual J. Um, these are websites for software providers that use that calculation and allow you to draw a building in their software and figure out what the load is. Um, this is sort of the newest uh, kit on the block in load calculation software. It's a 3D model 
and uh, and it's pretty cool but it does encourage you to do bad things. Like if you built a duct system that looks like what's in that picture, it'd be a really bad duct system. Too big and wavy. What we're looking for is compact and very straight lines. Um, and like I said, duct system building is a class we could spend days on. Um, so these are sort of typical load calcs. Um, our industry tends to oversize things. So the importance of this is that this number is the size of the house, and this is a lot less capacity than would typically get installed, and oversizing causes significant losses, right? So this is basically um, just over two tons of capacity. This is almost 3,000 square feet of house, and it's under a ton and a half, um, so really small system capacity. This is a huge house. It's 5,000 square feet, and it's just over two tons of required capacity. And you know this from doing a load calculation. And I don't, pardon me, have time to spend a lot of time on this. But the, the thing we need to avoid is this. This is called the submittal sheet. Um, and so it's the thing that you would turn into an architect saying, this is what I'm going to install. And it gives you, you know, this is a, a 9,000 BTU unit. And it has between 3,000 and 12,000 BTUs of cooling capacity. And you have no idea under what conditions that occurs. You have to go into what's called expanded data, which is this thing. And in this particular sheet, you're seeing airflows over here and outside conditions over here and capacities in here. And again, this is like, we could spend all day talking about how to do this. This is the thing you need to learn. There are classes about manual J and equipment selection. And, and that's where you go to figure out how to do this. But just know that if you do a load calc and it says that your system has a two ton load, you can't necessarily just go buy a two ton heat pump. It's a little more complicated than that. Um, this is another example of expanded data. This just happens to be from a different manufacturer. And you have to decide whether you're gonna do ducted systems or not ducted systems. Ducted systems deal with the entire house effectively um, and they're slightly lower efficiency. They also provide air filtration effectively. The non-ducted systems are higher efficiency, super, super quiet. Um, actually, I wanna take that back. Both of those systems can be extremely quiet if they're installed well. Um, the ducted system primarily is really high efficiency, generally lower install cost, but lacks the air filtration and the ability to deal with lots of different rooms. Um, these are some targets that you would work against. Um, and again, this slide represents the outline of a day long class. Um, so it's equipment capacity. So you would use these as like uh, check numbers. If I'm installing a system, I want it to not be more than one ton per thousand square feet of floor area. Um, duct leakage should never be more than 20 CFM. Um, total, regardless of the size of the equipment, uh, duct conduction has to be limited, room by airflow has to be, room by room airflow needs to be within 10% of design, you get the design from the load calculation software. Um, when you're sizing ducts, you would use these metrics, 300 to 500 foot per minute, air speed of the airflow in each duct, so you need to know how much air is going through each duct, which means you need to know how much air goes to each room. Um, total system airflow of five to 700 CFM per ton of capacity. Fan power should be less than five, um, or you should get more than five CFM per watt of power or else you're, you have too much resistance in your system. Refrigerant charge dealt with the way that we talked about in previous slides. And here's just some building pictures. This is well sealed ducts. This is a low conduction duct, right? Like that's a big return duct and that's it buried in insulation. So it has high R value. This is a duct, these are both um, systems in condition space. This is a duct built into a hallway assembly. And this is an entire duct system built into a hallway assembly um, and a couple of drop ceilings, all in condition space. Room by room airflow is something that is not in code at all. So we should know how many CFM are delivered to each grill and then build everything to make that happen including sizing the grill so that we know how far the air goes. And all of that's available information that you can have before install, during install, and then test it commissioning. Total system airflow can be measured. 
as the total of the supplies or as a one unit measurement using a thing called a flow grid. <clears throat> and then you have to commission these things, right? So this is our worksheet that we actually do on every system. And so this is all of the rooms in house, in the house, target airflows, our measured airflows, total airflow, static pressures and power consumption are all recorded and compared against the metrics that we had in earlier slides. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then refrigerant charge looks like this. And whenever possible, if we don't have to hook up to the refrigerant system, we shouldn't, right? Every time we hook up to the refrigerant system, we release refrigerant. So learning how to measure airflow, power, temperatures, and seeing if the system is working properly with those metrics allows you to diagnose a system by not testing refrigerant charge. Okay, so I, yeah, I've got about 10 more slides about water heaters and I don't wanna cut them. And so I don't know how much trouble I'm getting in here with uh, um, folks at 3C Ran. Are you guys still okay? I know I'm, I've run over, I apologize. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. no, okay. No worries, if people need to jump off at noon, um, Feel free to, we'll send them the recording. And if they have any questions, they could send them our way. We'll get right, them. yeah, so for any of you that have to cut out and totally understand, and if you can give us a few more minutes, um, I'll do my best to make it worth your time. So heat pump water heaters have been sort of fascinating um, as they've evolved. One of the things that happened is people got really excited, right? Because the thing makes cold air. Right? It makes hot water and it also makes cold air. And people are like, well, this is cool. We're going to put it in the house, right? Because it's free air conditioning. And so location of the system is something that's had tons of talk about it. And here's the science around location of the system in a nutshell. If you put the unit inside your house during heating season, you're stealing heat from your heater. So the net effect in heating system with the heat pump inside the building enclosure is a negative. You end up using, you have mechanical losses in, in your development of heat and you sort of do it twice. So that air conditioning benefit that you get um, in the summer is not great for the wintertime. Garages, on the other hand, tend to work really well. Um, you get air conditioning in your garage a little bit from this heat pump that you have out there. And then if you want, you can duct the air to outside for wintertime so you don't make the garage cold. So um, location is important, but the primary thing about location is whether there's enough space around the heat pump for heat absorption. Does it have enough air volume to be able to get enough heat to heat the water? So we're gonna look at that again. Um, and there, you know, I was, I've talked a whole bunch about tons, right? And, and tons of air conditioning. In space cooling, Space heating and cooling, smaller equipment is better. In water heating, you don't really have any, you don't get to choose how big the equipment capacity is. They're all pretty low. They don't make a lot of hot water at once, but you, get, you do get to pick how big the tank is. And that tank is the equivalent of a battery of hot water. So the bigger the tank is, the better off you are. Um, and then that location piece that I also just mentioned is about, um, access to available ambient air. And then we have a little commissioning stuff we can look at. Um, there's not a lot, actually. These are kind of simple once you get your head wrapped around um, where you're gonna put it. So these are different machines. This is uh, a unitary machine made by Ream. This is a unitary machine made by A.O. Smith. This is a unitary one 10 volt machine. So the other two are both 220. And this is an installed unitary machine. And this machine is in a confined space. You, you can see that they've vented the space. Personally, I don't think that this is the right strategy for a confined space. I think you're better off venting the space, but also ducting the unit to outside. Because in this, in this particular install, the thing is releasing cold air into the space that it's in. And it's, there's nothing driving that cold air out of the space to outside. And so what you want is to get the cold air from the unit 
all the way out of the space and new air from outside around the machine. So it has access to new air. This is a machine that's a unitary machine and it's not a hybrid. Yeah, I did. I mean, I called these hybrids for, for a second. I thought I'd forgotten to do that. In all of these machines, they have a heat pump and an electric resistance coil. The electric resistance coil's job is for makeup, right? Like the heat pump hall, falls behind, the electric resistance coil turns on and it adds heating capacity. It draws a huge amount of power. So ideally, you don't want it to happen. In this scenario, there's no electric resistance coil. So this is sort of the highest efficiency unitary unit, meaning all one piece, um, available because it has no electric resistance coil. And these have been installed with families of four and five people and kept up just fine. If you do things like wash the dishes and leave the tap running the whole time you wash the dishes, you can deplete this machine, right? Like it, it, its recovery periods are very long. So you have to be a little careful about water usage, but um, really actually very successful machine. <clears throat> All of those machines that I, I showed you use high global warming potential refrigerants. And generally speaking, there's no annual service. So nobody should be hooking up to them and releasing refrigerants. So that's good. Even though the refrigerants are not great, this is better. This uses carbon dioxide as its refrigerant. Um, and, uh, and in order for carbon dioxide to work as a refrigerant it has to function at really high pressures, like 3000 PSI. So the entire refrigerant cycle is in the outside unit and the hot water is in the tank inside. Um, and so there's, there's only one of these for sale that I know of at the moment in the United States which is the Sandin split system unit. And when I say only one, I mean only one CO2 heat pump. There are others in, for sale outside the United States. Um, the downside to the Sandin CO2 system is just very expensive. It's easily twice the cost of the other machines. And so I have installed these, I've installed a bunch of them, um, but uh, I think their market share is really small based on cost. All of these machines, including the sand, and have a low heating output, right? So I've put in gas water heaters over the years that can do like 100,000 BTUs per hour. So you can heat like the whole tank of water, 50 or 60 gallons in like 15 minutes. These heat pump machines take hours to heat their 50 or 60 gallon tank. Um, and it's generally not a problem, right? We have a couple of available Strategies, one is get the biggest tank that you can afford and the space will allow. If you need more capacity than that, you can raise the tank temperature to say 150 degrees and use a thing called a mixing valve to lower the delivered water temperature back down to 120. And so you're basically stretching the volume of the tank because you take less hot water out every time you use hot water in the house. Um, so things that you'll check and think about during design is adequate air volume around where you want to put the piece of equipment. If not, you might want to change the location. Does the system have resistance heat and are you going to train the customer how to use it? And then what recirculation systems are you going to pair with them? Pardon me. Um, so we've said this a few times, if you starve the heat pump, for available heat, then it will fail. It needs to have enough available heat in the air around it. Um, and you have some workaround strategies like this, where this particular system intakes air here, exhausts it there, so the cold air exhausts through that vent, and new warm air comes in through this vent. So it's, it's changing the air in its little mechanical space while it's working. Keeping that air volume thing in mind, the next most important thing is reducing the footprint of the plumbing system. Ideally, you get the hot water as close to the end uses as possible. And the way to think about this is every pipe has water in it. And once the water in the pipe is cooled off, you have to displace that water to get hot water from the tank to the end use. And it takes about two times as much water as there is in the pipe before the hot water starts to come out. And there's a plumbing strategy called structured plumbing, all about how to design water heating systems with this in mind. It's taught by Gary Klein. 
it's coming up at 3C Ren, which is great. He's awesome. And, and this concept is super useful. Um, I've replumbed a bunch of houses using Gary's ideas and it, they work wonderfully. And if you want to check them out on YouTube, that's a link. Um, some of the manufacturers, for some reason, well, actually, I think I know why. They're trying to, the manufacturers want their systems to be out there in the world and they don't want any callbacks, right? Nobody complains. So the way they keep people from complaining is make sure they never run out of hot water. So they have a control um, strategy in their menu that, you know, the machine has a little digital display and you can change things and a phone app where you can change things. And there's a, there's a strategy in there called uh, efficiency mode, which makes it use electric resistance heat the most. So the least efficient operation mode is called efficiency mode so that people will select it accidentally and never complain about running out of hot water. Right, it's it's a it's a manufacturer's workaround, but it's it's not telling people the truth. So one of the education things for us is to talk to homeowners about okay, I know this says efficiency mode, but this uses the most power. You're going to need this, like when your extended family's in town, or if you have two more kids and there's more people in the house. But outside of those scenarios, you probably don't need to use this at all, and your electric consumption goes way down. And so it's, it's something we have to educate users about. Um, this is a horrible slide. It breaks all the rules. It's too much text. It's hard to read. But later, when you're looking at the slides, if you read this, it'll explain some things. Um, what I want you to get right now is that across the bottom of this slide is water usage in gallons per day. And on the left is that coefficient of performance, which is efficiency. There's three different machines here. And they're showing that the more water the machine uses, the higher the efficiency is. And that occurs because the heat pump portion of the water heater is happiest when there's a bigger temperature difference between the water and the refrigerant. So cold water getting heated is more efficient than warm water getting heated. So they build the tanks so that they're de-stratified, I'm sorry, stratified on purpose. Cold water at the bottom, hot water at the top. Cold water gets heated and then returned to the top of the tank where it's hot. And so this is this relationship is very durable. The more water that you heat, the more cold water you put in the bottom, the more efficient the system is. This is what happens when you use electric resistance heat. To get the same amount of water out of the system in any given day, your electrical consumption goes way up and your efficiencies go way down. So most efficient operation is without electric resistance heat, significantly less efficient operation, still better than an electric resistance water heater, but not as good as it could be, is allowing electric resistance heat to continue to be used. This machine right there that didn't change has no electric resistance heat. Um, so I said most of this already, the systems are stratified by design, There's cold water at the bottom, hot water at the top. Heat pump efficiency is higher when the unheated water is colder. Um, so the less we recirculate water in and out of the tank, the more likely it'll stay stratified and the efficiency will be better. So we need to use efficient recirculation systems, which are not the smart ones and not consistent on demand, um, you know, constant demand. They're the simple on-demand systems where you either push a button or walk into the bathroom and the thing recirculates for two minutes and then it stops. The on-demand systems give you hot water when you need it and they have the least amount of negative imp impact on the tank, on the heat pump tank. Um, it takes like 25 minutes of continual recirculation um, to completely de-stratify a big heat pump tank. So any sort of constant recirculation is gonna hurt your efficiency significantly. Okay, I'm way over time. I'm happy to take questions. I don't know, how, how do you wanna proceed? Yeah, we could we could do, if anybody on the call has a pressing question, we could go ahead and answer it. I wanted to make sure that we answered Ted's um, about what are the factors that make the ducts in the new system better, insulation, appropriate size, replacement. Um, I know you kind of covered that in there, but just 
maybe reiterating some of that. Yeah, and, and I went over the specific slides quickly. So um, there's a reference in the slides to that specific question for you, Ted, with um, targets that you can look at. So duct leakage at near zero, so less than 20 CFM 25 using the duct blaster test. Um, R value of the duct, minimum R8. Uh, if, if it's in an attic, then bury it. So your duct R value becomes R38 at a minimum and goes up, to, up from there. Um, if you can redesign the system so that the equipment and the ducts are inside the building enclosure, we get that. Um, and then the rest of it is about uh, rethinking the duct system itself. Like we normally have um, supplies for heating and cooling over windows. Um, and in the newer, more efficient designs, we pull the supply back to the inside edge of the room and don't run the duct all, you know, all that extra distance. So shorter ducts. And then you really have to do the load calculation stuff. You need to know how much airflow is going to each room. Supply ducts then. So once I know a room needs 100 CFM, I can do the calculation to figure out um, I want the air to go to that room at between three and 500 foot per minute. And so if I want 300 foot per minute, I can calculate 100 CFM at 300 foot per minute gives me this size duct. And now I know the size of the, of the duct that I need it to be diameter wise. And so we do all of that stuff. And it's all sort of uh, outlined in those two slides. Anybody else? If, if not, I know we're a little bit over time. Um, you could send, feel free to send us any questions as well. Um, yes, please. And then you have my contact information uh, independently if that comes up later and you want to ask me a question. Um, you're very welcome. Well, since nobody is speaking up, you should do your next slide. You want your next slide? Of course, yeah. Um, just really quickly, um, Sarah, if you could um, launch the poll, just a little feedback on today's class. Any feedback is super helpful. So if you could please fill out that poll. And just really quickly, um, wanted to thank everyone who tuned in today. Um, things that are coming up, if you have any questions regarding continuing units, feel free to email me. I'll drop my email on the chat. And yeah, um, we what's coming to your inbox, we'll send out the recording of today's session, the slides, and additional survey for, for more feedback on that. And please feel free to ask any questions that we didn't cover today um, via Dan's email or mine. Um, and just some upcoming HPF courses. We have water heating distribution best practices on 1011 and how to assess your home for electrification 1115 and just a little bit more um, classes that are going to be available for us in our calendar. I'll be sure to drop our website for that. Um, the next slide, please, Sam. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm and, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing. And just ending with that, um, if you want to learn more about 3CRN and our classes and our programs, feel free to check out our website on 3CRN.org and any questions too to our general info, um, email at info at 3CRN.org. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Dan, for a great presentation and I hope you feel better. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Bye, everyone.